Hello, and welcome to The Essential Reads. My name is Isaac, and my goal is to bring to you a bunch of classic audiobooks in an easy and accessible way. This is my second time recording this, as the first time was not the complete version, but was a stupid abridged version that people give to people in school. Um, read the full versions in school. Like, I understand that Edgar Allan Poe was written in the, you know, the 1800s and whatnot, and we had words like hath and doth and things like this, but they're words. Use them. They are good for you to learn. Teachers, give your kids, give your students the real books. Don't give them little stupid abridged versions. They're not good, and they make me make mistakes and have to rework my entire day. So I'm recording currently at 8 p.m. instead of recording at my normal recording hours because I found out very, very late that um, I recorded the wrong version of this. So this is Thursday. This is going out tomorrow, and it's your fault, teachers. It's your fault. The American school system needs to change, but that's a topic for a different day. But this is your fault. Anyway, this is The Fall of the House of Usher (laughs) by Edgar Allan Poe, and let's begin before I expletives um, myself. Part one. During the whole of a dull, dark, and soundless day in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, I had been passing alone on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of the country, and at length found myself, as the shades of the evening drew on, within view of the melancholy House of Usher. I know not how it was, but with the first glimpse of the building, a sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirits. I say insufferable, for the feeling was unrelieved by any of that half-pleasurable, because poetic sentiment, with which the mind usually receives even the sternest natural images of the desolate or terrible. I looked upon the scene before me, upon the mere house, and the simple landscape features of the domain, upon the bleak walls, upon the vacant eye-windows, upon a few rank sedges, and upon a few white trunks of decayed trees, with an utter depression of soul which I can compare to no earthly sensation more properly than to the after-dream of the reveller upon opium, the bitter lapse into everyday life, the hideous dropping off of the veil. There was an iciness, a sinking, a sickening of the heart, an unredeemed dreariness of thought which no goading of the imagination could torture into aught of the sublime. What was it? I paused to think. What was it that so unnerved me to the contemplation of the House of Usher? It was a mystery all insoluble. Nor could I grapple with the shadowy fancies that crowded upon me as I pondered. I was forced to fall back on the unsatisfactory conclusion that while, beyond a doubt, there are combinations of very simple natural objects which have the power of thus affecting us, Still the analysis of this power lies among considerations beyond our depth. It was possible, I reflected, that a mere different arrangement of the particulars of the scene, of the details of the picture, would be sufficient to modify, or perhaps annihilate its capacity for sorrowful impressions. And, acting upon this idea, I reined my horse to the precipitous brink of a black and lurid tarn that lay in unruffled lustre by the dwelling, and gazed down, but with a shudder even more thrilling than before, upon the remodeled and inverted images of the grey sedge, and the ghastly tree stems, and the vacant eye-like windows. Nevertheless, in this mansion of gloom I now proposed myself a sojourn of some weeks. Its proprietor, Roderick Usher, had been one of my boon companions in boyhood, but many years had elapsed since our last meeting. A letter, however, had lately reached me in a distant part of the country, a letter from him, which, in his wildly importunate nature, had admitted of no other than a personal reply. The MS gave evidence of nervous agitation. The writer spoke of acute bodily illness, of a mental disorder which oppressed him, and of an earnest desire to see me, his best, and indeed his only personal friend, with the view of attempting, by the cheerfulness of my society, some alleviation on his malady. It was the manner in which all this, and much more, was said. It was the apparent heart that went with his request, which allowed me no room for hesitation, and I accordingly obeyed forthwith what I considered a very singular summons. Although, as boys, we had been even intimate associates, 
yet I really knew little of my friend. His reserve had been always excessive and habitual. I was aware, however, that his very ancient family had been noted, time out of mind, for a peculiar sensibility of temperament, displaying itself through long ages in many works of exalted art, and manifested of late in repeated deeds of munificent yet unobtrusive charity, as well as in a passionate devotion to the intricacies, perhaps even more than to the orthodox and easily recognizable beauties of musical science. I had learned, too, the very remarkable fact that the stem of the usher race, all time-honored as it was, had put forth, at no period, any enduring branch. In other words, that the entire family lay in the direct line of descent, and had always, with very trifling and very temporary variation, so lain. It was this deficiency, perhaps of collateral issue, and the consequent undeviating transmission from sire to son of the patrimony with the name, which had, at length, so identified the two as to merge the original title of the estate in the quaint and unequivocal appellation of the House of Usher, an appellation which seemed to include, in the minds of the peasantry who used it, both the family and the family mansion. I have said that the sole effect of my somewhat childish experiment, that of looking down within the tarn, had been to deepen the first singular impression. There can be no doubt that the consciousness of the rapid increase of my superstition, for why should I not term it, served mainly to accelerate the increase itself. Such, I have long known, is the paradoxical law of all sentiments having terror as a basis. And it might have been for this reason only, that, when I again uplifted my eyes to the house itself, from its image in the pool, there grew in my mind a strange fancy. A fancy so ridiculous, indeed, that but I mention it to show the vivid force of sensations which oppressed me. I had so worked upon my imagination as really to believe that about the whole mansion and domain there hung an atmosphere peculiar to themselves and their immediate vicinity, an atmosphere which had no affinity with the air of heaven, but which reeked up from the decayed trees and the grey wall and the silent tarn, a pestilent and mystic vapour, dull, sluggish, faintly discernible, and leaden-hued. Shaking off from my spirit what must have been a dream, I scanned more narrowly the real aspect of the building. Its principal feature seemed to be that of an excessive antiquity. The discoloration of ages had been great. Minute fungi overspread the whole exterior, hanging in a fine tangled webwork from the eaves. Yet all this was apart from any extraordinary dilapidation. No portion of the masonry had fallen, and there appeared to be a still wild inconsistency between its still perfect adaptation of parts and the crumbling condition of the individual stones. In this, there was much that reminded me of the old, specious totality of old woodwork, which has rotted for long years in some neglected vault, with no disturbance of the breath of the external air. Beyond this indication of extensive decay, however, the fabric gave little token of instability. Perhaps the eye of a scrutinizing observer might have discovered a barely perceptible fissure, which, extending from the roof of the building in front, made its way down the wall in zigzag direction until it became lost in the sullen waters of the tarn. Noticing these things, I rode over a short causeway to the house. A servant in waiting took my horse, and I entered the gothic archway of the hall. A valet of stealthy step thence conducted me in silence, through many dark and intricate passages, in my progress to the studio of his master. Much that I encountered on the way contributed, I know not how, to heighten the vague sentiment of which I have already spoken. While the objects around me, while the carvings of the ceilings, the somber tapestries of the walls, the ebon blackness of the floors, and the phantasmagoric armorial trophies which rattled as I strode were but matters to which, or to such as which I had been accustomed from infancy. While I hesitated not to acknowledge how familiar all this was, I still wondered to find how unfamiliar were the fancies which ordinary images were storing up. On one of the staircases I met the physician of the family. His countenance, I thought, wore a mingled expression of low cunning and perplexity. He accosted me with trepidation and passed on. The valet now threw open a door and ushered me into the presence of his master. The room in which I found myself was very large and lofty. The windows were long, narrow, and pointed, and at so vast a distance from the black oaken floor as to be altogether inaccessible from within. Feeble gleams of encrimsoned light made their way through the trestled panes, and served to render sufficiently distinct the more prominent objects around. 
The eye, however, struggled in vain to reach the remoter angles of the chamber, or the recesses of the vaulted and fretted ceiling. Dark draperies hung upon these walls. The general furniture was profuse, comfortless, antique, and tattered. Many books and musical instruments lay scattered about, but failed to give any vitality to the scene. I felt that I breathed an atmosphere of sorrow. An air of stern, deep, and irredeemable gloom hung over and pervaded all. Upon my entrance, Usher rose from a sofa on which he had been lying at full length, and greeted me with a vivacious warmth which had much in it, I at first thought, of an overdone cordiality, of the constrained effort of the ennuyé man of the world. A glance, however, at his countenance convinced me of his perfect sincerity. We sat down, and for some moments, while he spoke not, I gazed upon him with a feeling half of pity, half of awe. Surely man had never before so terribly altered in so brief a period as had Roderick Usher. It was with difficulty that I could bring myself to admit the identity of the one being before me with the companion of my early boyhood. Yet the character of his face had been at all times remarkable. A cadaverousness of complexion, an eye large, liquid, and luminous beyond comparison. Lips somewhat thin and very pallid, but of a surpassingly beautiful curve. A nose of a delicate Hebrew model, but with a breadth of nostril unusual in similar formations. A finely moulded chin, speaking, in its want of prominence, of a want of moral energy. Hair of a more than web-like softness and tenuity. These features, with an inordinate expansion above the regions of the temple, made up altogether a countenance not easily to be forgotten. And now, in the mere exaggeration of the prevailing character of these features, and of the expressions they were wont to convey, lay so much of change that I doubted to whom I spoke. The now ghastly pallor of the skin, and the now miraculous luster of the eye, above all things, startled and even awed me. The silken hair, too, had been suffered to grow all unheeded, and as, in its wild gossamer texture, it floated rather than fell about the face, I could not, even with effort, connect its arabesque expression with any idea of simple humanity. In the manner of my friend, I was at once struck with an incoherence, an inconsistency, and I soon found this to arise from a series of feeble and futile struggles to overcome an habitual trepidancy, an excessive nervous agitation. For something of this nature, I had indeed been prepared, no less by his letter than by reminiscences of certain boyish traits and by conclusions deduced from his particular physical conformation and temperament. His action was alternately vivacious and sullen. His voice varied rapidly from a tremulous indecision, when the animal spirits seemed utterly in abeyance, to that species of energetic concision, that abrupt, weighty, unhurried, and hallowed-sounding enunciation, that leaden, self-balanced, and perfectly modulated guttural utterance, which may be observed in the lost drunkard or the irreclaimable eater of opium during the periods of his most intense excitement. It was thus that he spoke of the object of my visit, of his earnest desire to see me, and of the solace he expected me to afford him. He entered at some length into what he conceived to be the nature of his malady. It was, he said, a constitutional and family evil, and one for which he despaired to find a remedy. A mere nervous affection, he immediately added, which would undoubtedly soon pass off. It displayed itself in a host of unnatural sensations. Some of these, as he detailed them, interested and bewildered me, although perhaps the terms and general manner of the narration had their weight. He suffered much from a morbid acuteness of the senses. The most insipid food was alone endurable. He could wear only garments of a certain texture. The odors of all flowers were oppressive. His eyes were tortured by even a faint light. And there were but peculiar sounds, and these from stringed instruments, which did not inspire him with horror. To an animalious species of terror, I found him a bounden slave. I shall perish, said he. I must perish in this deplorable folly. Thus, and not otherwise, I shall be lost. I dread the events of the future, not in themselves, 
but in their results. I shudder at the thought of any, even the most trivial incident, which may operate upon this intolerable agitation of soul. I have, indeed, no abhorrence of danger, except in its absolute effect, in terror, in this unnerved, in this pitiable condition. I feel that the period will sooner or later arrive when I must abandon life and reason together in some struggle with the grim phantasm, fear. Thank you so very much for listening. If you enjoyed, please like, comment, share all that jazz. And if you really enjoyed, do subscribe because there is more to come. If you're listening on podcast, please leave a review as it helps get them in front of as many people as possible and reading them really makes my day. Also, share it around. Help me make this into a very, very large audiobook podcast and not a okay-sized audio podcast <laughs> slash YouTube channel. Ugh! Sorry, I needed to get that out. That was my second time recording that. Um, once was a very short version, like I mentioned at the start of this episode. And this was the second time. Much longer, much more detailed, much better. That was the end of part one. Uh, part two will be in one week's time. So we'll see you there. Once again, thank you very much for listening. And until next time, bye-bye. Do all the things. Click the links, descriptions, and whatnot. <laughs>